ਕਰ ਦਿੱਤਾ ਕੌਲ very good evening to all of you we bring you greetings from anne velangani college of engineering kanyakumari on behalf of the management and all the board members we wholeheartedly uh, welcome you all to this uh, webinar program uh, in this crucial period we are conducting so wholeheartedly once again i welcome all the participants from different districts and different states and even from um the rice university from usa and from all the universities from zambia africa and bahrain 
So in different parts of the countries, people are joined in this movement. So once again, say thank you very much and uh, congratulate you for this uh, wonderful session is going to happen uh, within a short period. So before that, I need to introduce the speaker of this day, uh, Dr. Sterling Leo Hudson, who is going to uh, chair with you for the one hour program. So let me have a few minutes introduction about this uh, research person. So after that, uh, we, I'll handle the session. And Dr. Sterling Leo Hudson is the director of research of Pannai Velangani College of Engineering. He completed his post-doctorate post fellowship in National Institute of Standards and Technology, Washington, D.C., USA. And he completed his PhD in Banaras Hindu University, Varanasi. And he, his research highlights is hydrogen storage materials, carbon nanomaterials, hydrogen fueled devices. And he had a very good publications of 26 publications. And he has written two books. And uh, all these were in uh, Scopus Index journals with an impact, very good high impact factor. And he was awarded the doctorate degree from the Central University of Tamil Nadu. And he guided many research projects. And uh, now he completed major research projects. That is investigations on nano confinement effect of lightweight material hydrates for onboard storage of hydrogen in zero emission vehicles by U.S. Department of States and NIST, Washington, D.C., USA. And the amount sanctioned for this project is around INR rupees 54 lakhs. And the investigation on strategic materials for sustainable energy storage applications in the Department of Science and Technology by Government of India, sanctioned the amount of 82 lakhs. And he had a significant awards received by Fulbright Award by the US government in 2017, Inspire Faculty Award by Department of Science and Technology in 2012, Dr. D.S. Kothagri Award by UGC 2012, Indo-US Exchange Researcher, in 2011, Indo-Sweden Exchange Researcher in 2010, CSAR Senior Research Fellow Award in 2012 and 2010. And he has many administrative responsibilities as Board of Studies member of MTEC Material Science and Nanotechnology program in Central University of Tamil Nadu. And Director of Research in Annai Velangani College of Engineering for the past two years. So the great success and the great entrepreneur and great administrator, great researcher. So who is going to share and have a say, good session? And now I hand over the session to Dr. Sterling Leo Hudson. Over to Dr. Sterling Leo Hudson. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for the uh, detailed introduction. Welcome, welcome. I couldn't uh, see my video. Can you? Yeah, I can see your video. I can oh. see. Oh, okay, okay. Thank you. I That's can cool. see the video. Uh, good afternoon to all. Uh, it's my immense pleasure to welcome you all for this uh, webinar talk. Uh, myself, Sterling. And uh, I would, uh, uh, on the outset, I would express my gratitude to our college chairman, college principal, and uh, college director for organizing this event. So uh, the topic which I have chosen for today's talk is uh, opportunities and challenges on hydrogen energy and fuel cell technology. In this talk, I will give you a brief introduction of uh, the current uh, energy technology that is being widely implemented. And then uh, I will also discuss about uh, the future technology that is going to come in the near future, that is hydrogen energy and fuel cell technology. Uh, and also, and also it's about uh, the uh, issues and challenges with this technology and uh, how different countries are progressing towards implementing this technology for uh, future applications. Future, uh, excuse me, I couldn't see my PowerPoint. The PowerPoint is like another part of this. Huh? 
mesmo que Sorry for that. I couldn't see my PowerPoint on screen. Uh, who's disabling attendees? Screen share. in the parking lot. Hello? Hello? Sir, kindly share your screen. There is an option in share screen. There is an option in share screen. You can send the PPT. Through share screen, you can share. So let me start with the introduction, Rising Energy Demand and its Challenges. So life on Earth requires energy for survival. All living beings, irrespective of whether it is single cell or multicellular organism, consume fuel and produce the required energy for their survival. And at the same time, they may also emit waste products during the energy production process. And the predominant waste which is being produced during this energy production process is carbon dioxide. And the higher the quality of life one would have, higher will be the CO2 emission. So this graph shows a comparative analysis of uh, energy usage on average people living in developed countries as well as in developing countries. So the, uh, the top part above this curve corresponds to the average energy usage of people living in developed countries and correspond to the average energy usage of people living in developing countries. So if you look into the world energy demand, at 2000 it was 13 terawatts. Because of the continuous rising population and industrial revolution, it is expected the world energy demand may rise up to 30 terawatts by 2050, which is more than twice than that it was at 2000. So really, this is the challenging issue. How we are going to ensure our future energy needs, how we are, we are going to satisfy our future energy needs. If you, look, if you look into the developed countries, for example, US, Australia, they are already in the saturated state. Yes. So the, the maximum, the people living in this country are, are using the maximum amount of energy one would expect in the case of developing countries. So in the coming future, these developed nations are not going to add much more energy usage in, on an average uh, in the, from the current trend. But the challenging part is the developing nations because mainly India and China, 
the majority of world population lies in these countries and the economic growth of these countries are growing fast. As a result, in the coming years, more and more people will be moving towards a higher quality life. And that is the biggest challenging issue in the coming future, that these developing nations are, uh, are in need of excess uh -huh. of energy. So how we are going to ensure our future energy security is a big challenging task. And the other important issue is, at present, nearly 80% of our energy demand is met from uh, fossil fuels. So that is a natural resource. We know that it takes millions of years for nature to generate oil by bacterial fermentation at extreme temperature and pressure. But if we could see here, since after the Industrial Revolution in 1930, the annual oil production steeply increases. Now, in 2010, I am talking about the pre-lockdown period, the world oil consumption of 96.5 million barrels of crude oil per day. So taking into account of the increasing consumption rate because of the increasing uh, need, uh, particularly in the growing uh, countries, it is expected by 2050, the world oil reserve will be completely depleted. So that means, you, you know that it is impossible for us to create this crude oil in laboratory condition. So we are depleting and destroying the natural resources. So that is a challenging issue. In future, we have to ensure our natural, natural, uh, natural um, uh, crude oil reserves. And also we have to find a fuel that is independent of natural resources. So we should not depend on the natural resources. We can exploit the resource, but we should not deplete the natural resources. So that is a challenging uh, issue that we have to tackle. And more importantly, this, uh, the, uh, the usage of uh, this crude oil will emit carbon dioxide uh, based greenhouse gases. We know that. And the majority of uh, the predominant source of these CO2 emissions are from industrial exhaust and automobile sectors. And the adverse effect of this CO2 emission or uh, the climate change, and we all know that we are witnessing that the changes and uh, the average global temperature raise can also happen, it is predicted. And if it happens, the Arctic ice caps will melt and that leads to the increase in sea level. So most of the coastal uh, cities are in danger in, if we uh, continue to use these fossil fuels and if we continue to produce this CO2 emission. And other adverse effects are like water resource depletion that, that was happened in South Africa, I think. So these are some of the challenging issues that we have to address for our future. So I would like to uh, highlight one recent, uh, research, uh, one recent uh, news which was published in Hindustan Times last month. So in this news, what they found is the Central Pollution Control Board of India have reported that uh, they have analyzed the pollution data of Delhi just before the lockdown period and after 15 days of lockdown period. And the interesting result they found is the pollution level in Delhi has drastically uh, came down by 50%. So the particulate matter is 2.5 micron and particulate matter is 10 microns or uh, uh, have drastically came down. And this the major source of these particulate matters are from industrial exhaust and automobile sectors. So in the last 15 days during that lockdown period, the vehicles are not running on roads and also the most of the industries are under shut. So that creates the pollution level to come down. So if you, uh, what I want to convey here is if we think of a situation that if we could find a fuel which will not emit any harmful emission, then you can think of the environment. It will be clean and we can retain the originality of our surrounding and our environment. That is one of the challenging uh, parts that we have to find that a fuel which will not produce any harmful emission and also the fuel which should, uh, we can exploit the natural resource, but we should not deplete the natural resource. So the answer for these two questions lies on hydrogen. So being a lightest element and the most abundant element in the universe have enormous potential to overcome the current fuel crisis and also the mitigation of CO2. So if you look into the energy content, as a, if you look into the physical property, the chemical energy content of hydrogen is three times higher than that of petrol. For hydrogen, it is 33.33 kilowatt hour per kg, whereas that of petrol, it is 12.4 kilowatt hour per kg. So this means, in other words, if suppose I have a petrol vehicle, and if I, if I fill that vehicle with one liter of petrol, and I may get, suppose I get 50 uh, uh, kilometer driving range, 
The same vehicle, if I use uh, one kg of hydrogen, so I will get 150 uh, kilometer of driving distance. So that's what the chemical energy uh, density means. And now the second question comes is safety aspect. So hydrogen is comparatively safer than petrol. This is because the self ignition temperature of hydrogen is too high. That is 585 degrees centigrade. So if you look into the petrol, it is 228 degrees centigrade. This means that hydrogen will not burn of its own unless it gets ignited by an external heating agent or else the surrounding temperature reaches 585 degrees centigrade. Whereas petrol can undergo self ignition temperature at a relatively low temperature. And the diffusion velocity of hydrogen in air is quite high, that is 0.61 square centimeter per second. So this also comes in the safety aspect. Since hydrogen is 14 times lighter than air, if hydrogen gets leaked from the storage system, it will diffuse rapidly over the space due to buoyancy effect. It will not spill on the ground or on the vehicle. And if an accidental fire happens, it will the flame will diffuse rapidly over the space. Whereas in the case of petrol, its diffusion velocity in, in air is quite low. That is 0.05 uh, uh, centimeter square per second. So therefore, the petrol, if it leaks from the storage system, it will spill on the vehicle and, uh, ca uh, and cause severe damage in terms of accidental fire. It was experimentally demonstrated by Ford Motor Company in 1990, I guess. And in this video, they have intentionally uh, ruptured the fuel tank, which is of hydrogen, and they introduce a flame. As you can see that the flame was diffusing rapidly up. And simultaneously, they also tested a petrol vehicle. And the petrol vehicle completely catches fire within 46 seconds. <laughs> So hydrogen, they could able to extinguish that fire because it was in localized region just surrounding the fuel tank. So in that way, hydrogen is comparatively safer than petrol. And now the question comes, how we can produce hydrogen? So if I have nine liters of water and 53 kilowatt hour of electricity, then I can able to produce hydrogen that gives the energy, uh, one kg of hydrogen, that gives the energy which is equivalent to three kg of uh, petrol. So if I could generate this 45 kilowatt hour of electricity from any of the renewable sources, then I can say hydrogen as a completely renewable fuel. And upon usage, hydrogen on reaction with oxygen forms water vapor, and the energy will be utilized by the vehicle, either in fuel cell or in general combustion. So we are producing hydrogen from water, and we are getting back the same amount of water which we used to produce hydrogen. So it forms a clean and closed energy cycle. So at present, nearly 90% of the hydrogen production for industrial purpose is carried out by steam reformation of methane. So in this process, steam and methane are mixed at uh, pressure, at high pressure, and is allowed to pass through a reforming chamber in which a nickel catalyst is placed at around 1,100 uh, degrees centigrade to undergo a chemical reaction and form carbon monoxide and hydrogen. And in the second stage, this carbon monoxide again reacts with the steam at a relatively low temperature and forms carbon dioxide and hydrogen. So the, why this technique is widely uh, preferred for industrial application nowadays is because it is one of the cost effective method of producing large scale production with higher efficiency. The efficiency for, of uh, pro hydrogen production through this method is around 80% efficiency. That's the reason this um, uh, steam reformation of methane is preferred for industrial applications. But this is not the clean way of producing hydrogen. We are talking about hydrogen as a clean energy carrier, but the way by which hydrogen is produced is not a clean way of producing hydrogen because it generates carbon dioxide as a reaction byproduct. So what is a clean way of producing hydrogen is by electrolysis. So it is called water splitting reaction. So when we apply electric current between electrodes, deep in uh, uh, the electrolyte, electrolysis medium, which is nothing but water, the hydrogen and oxygen will be ev uh, evolved. Hydrogen will get evolved at the cathode and oxygen at the anode. The overall potential difference between this anode and cathode should be 1.2 volt uh, for uh, water splitting. So this is one of the clean way of producing hydrogen. But uh, the issue with this technology is that it requires energy. So we need electric energy for splitting this water. Where does this electric energy comes from? So mainly 
we have to give the energy input that that means electricity input in a clean way either solar or wind energy is preferred for future applications the other interesting uh, technique by which hydrogen is being produced is by photocatalytic splitting of water so here no need of input energy external energy is not needed so a uh, typically a semiconducting material whose band gap lies in the solar spectrum is preferred so when sunlight uh, light photons uh, from sunlight having band gap having energy greater than the band gap of this material incident it creates electron hole pair and this holes will uh, will uh, react with the uh, in the presence of oxidation catalyst for catalyst it split the hydrogen into proton and oxygen and this proton catch up this electron in the presence of reduction for catalyst and forms hydrogen molecule so this is uh, still it, it is an, in the research area because uh, the scientists were trying to develop this technique for large scale hydrogen production but unfortunately the amount of hydrogen produced by this technique is relatively lower as compared to that of electrolysis or steam reformation so the other uh, important technique which was uh, recently discovered is pyrolysis of methane so in this technique it, which is also similar to that of steam reformation of methane so methane is passed into a uh, bubble uh, reactor so bubble column reactor so in this case the methane undergo dissociation and this bubble column reactor is filled with molten state of metals such as tin is used so when this methane passes through this bubble chamber it can undergo thermal dissociation and forms carbon a solid carbon is formed as well as hydrogen this which comes out through this bubble chamber can be stored and it can be used for automobile or household appliances and the solid carbon so in steam reformation we get carbon dioxide but here we get solid carbon that is the advantage we can use that solid carbon for industrial applications such as dyes lightweight uh, construction and also polymer manufacturing battery manufacturing etc and the energy for this operation of this bubble column reactor can be obtained from any renewable source so i can completely say that it is a renewable way of producing hydrogen so now we have we have known that production technique but it itself not solve the issue so we need to have like the hydrogen economy is a proposed system of delivering energy from all parts like it has three ingredients production storage and application so the storage is a critical issue because being a country like india we have plenty of solar energy so we can use the solar energy to produce hydrogen of course we water electrolysis is one of the way we can produce hydrogen but before application it needs to be stored in a proper way because the safety of application depends on the mode of storage system therefore storage is a critical part which cuts across the production and application so uh, why this is challenging is because the boiling point of hydrogen is quite low that is minus 253 degree centigrade so to store uh, at room temperature hydrogen remains in the gaseous state and the density of gaseous hydrogen is quite low that is 0.00098 g per cc so it is since it is 14 times lighter than air to store 1 kg of hydrogen we require a volume of 11 meter cube which is practically difficult for automobile application so of course there are different storage modes like conventional high pressure storage modes and cryogenic storage modes but this conventional and high cryogenic storage modes or requires energy for pressurization as well as in some country this high pressure storage systems are not allowed because it is not safe and this liquid hydrogen storage system also requires energy for liquefaction and the disadvantage the drawback with liquid hydrogen storage system for particularly for automobile application is even if the vehicle is in ideal mode is in parking mode this cryogenic system needs to be uh, continuously uh, it should be maintained well below the boiling limit of liquid so it needs continuous operation that is consuming lot of energy so therefore for practical application this high pressure and the liquid hydrogen storage system have some sort of disadvantage so what is the third option for hydrogen storage so the third option for storing hydrogen is in the form of metal hydrates so which is also known as solid sponge like how a sponge absorb water molecule in a similar way this metal hydrate can absorb 
uh, hydrogen atoms in the inter interstitial sites. And this can be, this could be a safe mode for storing hydrogen. Actually, this was uh, a two-wheeler which was developed by us when I was doing my PhD, our group. And uh, it is a old model, uh, Hero Honda CD100. So as you can see, it is a, 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 the hydrogen storage method we used is metal hydrate storage system. So in this case, we have developed the storage uh, tank in such a way, the vehicle space available. So that is one of the advantage you can have, you can design the storage system in such a way based on the vehicle space available. So that is possible with metal hydrate storage system. And also it is safe for uh, uh, vehicular application. So now hydrogen storage materials are broadly classified into three categories. One is intermetallic hydrates, in which the hydrogen molecule get dissociated into atoms and these atoms will store in the interstitial sites of the metal hydrates. Uh, but the drawback with this material is usually these intermetallic hydrates are of combination of land, uh, rare earth metals and transition metal alloys. So as you can see, lanthanum, nickel, so these are heavy metals. So the metals which store hydrogen are of heavy metal, but the advantage is it is completely reversible uh, thousand or ten thousand cycles you can do uh, filling and uh, dissociation of hydrogen but the issue is it is too heavy but it has application in battery application you may have known that nickel metal hydride batteries and so on but for vehicular application it has drawback and the other material which is being focused now is complex metal hydride the advantage is it is lightweight they usually there is a strong bond involved between hydrogen and uh, alkali metal atoms. And the issue is we have to break this bond. If you want to uh, take out hydrogen from this uh, compound, you have to apply temperature to take this bond, uh, to break this bond and take out hydrogen from this system. So generally the engine exhaust heat is used, is recirculated into the storage tank so as to dissociate this bond and take out hydrogen from the system. But still, uh, the, the many of the high capacity hydrogen storage materials have high, needs higher temperature because the bonds are usually covalent or ionic bond, usually 300 or 400 degrees centigrade is required to take out hydrogen. And also the recyclability is the biggest challenge in this type of materials, but still it is in the, in, under research and development stage. And the other third type of materials are physics option materials. And this class of material, uh, traps the hydrogen molecules in the pores as well as the uh, available and the adsorption edges. So there it can undergo a physics option. It's, a, it's not a chemical, a strong chemical bond, but a weak chemical bond is involved in this third ki kind of material. And this kind of materials have great promise and now widely these materials are being tested for uh, gas storage application, not only in hydrogen storage, but also for CO2 storage application, these materials are being studied now. And so what is the target? So we have seen storage and there should be some target limitation. That was set by US Department of Energy. And the target was set in order to achieve a driving distance of four, uh, 200 miles in a single charge. For that, we need to store four kg of hydrogen on board the vehicle. So that is the biggest challenge. And also they put a condition that the storage system weight should not be, uh, should be less than 73 kilograms. So that means the tank, overall the hydrogen and the hydrogen storage material should be, should not be beyond 75 kilograms. And also the storage volume should be less than 10 liters. So it should not be beyond 10 liters of volume. So this is what the challenging part or the research part, people are trying to develop a new material which could satisfy this target. And there are other tar targets also, but this is a major target, the weight and volume ratio. So in comparison, this is a comparison of uh, different storage modes. As I said, the conventional storage modes, like high pressure storage system and liquid hydrogen storage system. If I store hydrogen at a pressure of 200 bar, then the volume of the tank in comparison to that of the vehicle is this much. But if I store in the liquid form, I can store the storage tank should be lower, uh, can be reduced to the volume of storage tank. But the issue is I have to maintain at 20 Kelvin. So it needs continuous supply of energy is needed. So the intermetallic system, I have uh, the previous slide we have seen, it is completely reversible. 
But the issue with this material is, in order to store 4 kg of hydrogen, I need to have 600 kg of meti uh, uh, storage material. But even though the volume occupies is very small, but these materials are too heavy. So therefore, it has drawback, even though it is completely reversible, but this is one of the drawback of this intermetallic hydrate. And the, the other, the current option is on complex metal hydrate or binary hydrate. So it is still in the R&D development stage. So usually it have a high capacity and the, uh, the weight uh, should be below 70 kg, which is within the limit of your DOE target. And also the storage uh, capacity, the volume wise also, it is very small. So therefore a lot of research effect, uh, efforts are going on on this type of material. So I would highlight some of the, in the last uh, 10 or 15 years, several materials are being tested so that whether it satisfies the USDOI limit. And, but till date, none of the material could be able to satisfy all the USDOI limits. So people are trying to develop different techniques, different methods, how to improve. So if, if we find some suitable material, the way by which we are trying to improve so that it can reach within the limit of USDOI targets. So some of the approaches we do is nano sizing the material so that the thermodynamic property, the, the heat transfer can be improved and also the kinetics. So this is one of the important parameters. So if I have a storage tank, it should supply uh, hydrogen so that the engine requirement or the fuel cell requirement, so whatever it needs, whether in high acceleration, it needs high, hydro, high mode of hydrogen flow that needs to be supplied. So therefore the kinetics needs to be improved and also the capacity, the weight, how much 4 kg of hydrogen, how much amount of storage material is required. So these are some of the aspects we do and also we make composites so that uh, the capacity can be improved or the thermodynamic properties can be improved or reversibility can be improved. So these are some of the research areas, different uh, peoples are trying to work uh, the materials to make it uh, suitable for uh, practical applications. So, the United States Industrial Development Organization predicted that it is, it is not possible like within a day or two, we can completely switch over from fossil fuel economy to hydrogen economy. Because if you remember the olden days, the bullock or transport, people were using bullock or transport. And from there, the change from bullock or economy to fossil fuel economy takes years. So similarly, the fossil fuel economy to hydrogen economy may take years. So it is, it is predicted by 2070 or 75, before 2075, the complete switching over from fossil fuel to hydrogen economy may happen. So coming back to the application of uh, fuel cells, so it can be even applied in laptops, in mobile phones, in uh, automobiles, cars, buses, and so on. But in my opinion, for laptops and Bat, uh, cell phones is battery could be the ideal choice. But fuel cell, even though fuel cell will work, but it may not be an ideal choice for uh, laptops or uh, uh, mobile phones. But for vehicular application, fuel cell is an ideal choice. So this is how the internal construction of a fuel cell vehicle looks like. A fuel cell, by the name itself, it indicates it needs fuel for operation. And in fact, the fuel is uh, supply is similar to that of what we have the gasoline vehicle and the fuel will be stored in a store onboard storage tank and this will be supplied with this fuel is directly fed into the fuel cell stack it looks like a loaf of bread actually depends on the energy uh, requirement these fuel cells individual fuel cells are stacked together and forms a fuel cell uh, array so you, you can have a, a number of fuel cells which are stacked together and this is the heart of this vehicle. So it generates from the fuel, it converts electricity, it produces electricity. And once the fuel cell produces electricity, uh, this electric drive system will drive the, it's a kind of electric motor which drives the vehicle. And in, in modern uh, fuel cell vehicle, they use super capacitors because these super capacitors can give a sudden boost, sudden power. So therefore, this supercapacitor will be charged while they're running by, from the fuel cell. But if some uh, power is needed, some immediate instantaneous power, then this supercapacitor gives an instantaneous power to the vehicle. So this is the basic construction of a uh, fuel cell vehicle, but it is a very simple. And now let us see what is a fuel cell. 
The fuel cell looks similar to that of a battery. It has an anode and a cathode. So anode and cathodes are usually made of platinum uh, coated uh, materials. And when a fuel cell knee is a is an open device, so battery is a closed device. That means uh, the chemical energy which is stored inside the battery will be converted into electrical energy. But in fuel cell is an open device. As long as you fed fuel into the into the fuel cell, it keeps on producing electricity. That is the advantage of fuel cell is being implemented for uh, uh, big vehicles or trucks or uh, trains and so on. So as long as you supply fuel, the fuel cell keeps on producing electricity. So the basic construction, it has an anode, it has an anode, it has a cathode, and when hydrogen, the fuel for fuel cell is hydrogen. So when hydrogen in contact with the anode, the anode is a platinum coated material. So because of that platinum, it, it, the hydrogen will dissociate into protons and electrons. So there is a semi-permeable membrane, which is called a proton exchange membrane, uh, is placed between this anode and cathode. So this proton exchange membrane allows only the proton to pass through, and it won't allow the electrons to pass through. So this electron has to travel through the external surface. And we know that the flow of electron uh, produce electricity. So that is the basics of this fuel cell. So when hydrogen comes in contact with the anode, the hydrogen molecule will dissociate into protons and electrons. This proton exchange membrane allows the proton to pass through the membrane and the electrons cannot pass through the membrane. So the electron has to go through the external circuit and it reaches the cat cathode where this proton which diffuses through the proton exchange membrane will react together along with oxygen from the atmosphere and forms water vapor. So the exhaust which is coming out from this fuel cell is, is a pure form of water vapor. So typically a fuel cell, a single fuel cell can produce 0.6 to 0.8 volt. So based on the requirement, the voltage requirement, normally the fuel cells are stacked together, the number of fuel cells are stacked together to the desired voltage. So it looks like a loaf of bread. You have a large number of uh, fuel cells which are stacked together. That is what fitted in fuel cell vehicle. So the same, uh, if you, this animation, I think. Uh, so when hydrogen in contact with uh, the catalyst anode, it's split into proton and electron. The electron cannot pass through the membrane, so it has to travel to an external circuit and produce electricity. So in battery, it's a closed device. Whatever the chemical energy which is stored in the battery will be uh, converted into electricity, and it needs periodic charging. Whereas in fuel cell, as long as we supply fuel, it keeps on producing electricity. So that is the advantage of fuel cell. And all the leading uh, automobile manufacturers are, have separate R&D for fuel cells, and they, they are developing new uh, fuel cells vehicles for future applications. So this is Hyundai x hydrogen fuel cell track, which was developed by Hyundai. And they also uh, develop uh, Gensel, which produce electricity from fuel cell uh, for household appliances. So the Hyundai is also developing hydrogen power Gensel. And also BMW have recently launched that BMW i hydrogen next. But for commercial, it may uh, uh, commercial level they may uh, it's it's still they uh, it's, they have showcased it, but not in the commercial market it has been come. So by 2022, they are planning to introduce this in the commercial market. And Rolls Royce have also uh, making giant uh, uh, jet engine for future aircraft applications and so on. So now, if you look into the country wise, so different countries are. Uh, may set the protocol that they are planning to switch to hydrogen economy. So Iceland is the first country they are planning to switch completely from fossil fuel economy to hydrogen economy by 2050. So they, uh, in Iceland, they have already started the investment. They, they have established a lot of fuel cell uh, uh, hydrogen pumping station and also fuel cell buses for uh, transport applications because Iceland have a lot of geothermal energy. So they use the geothermal energy for the electrolysis of water. So by that way, they are planning to make the environment clean. And uh, it is expected that the Iceland will, will be the first country uh, which is planning to switch completely to, from fossil fuel economy to hydrogen economy before 2050. 
and uh, germany have also started initiatives on hydrogen economy and uh, you might have read in newspaper this is uh, the first world's first hydrogen fuel cell train and it is in operation in many german lines since december 2017 and they have also tested a uh, hydrogen fuel cell four seater small jet and it is uh, it is capable to uh, fly up to 1500 kilometers and for take off and landing they use a battery for uh, uh, that powers during landing and take off but uh, while it is in full thrust this uh, uh, fuel cell will be in operation and switzerland have also started initiatives on hydrogen economy and this is the fuel cell ship that uh, they they have uh, developed and it uh, it has a inbuilt electrolyzer and the solar panel the top you what you have seen is a solar panel installed on the top and this solar panel produce electrical energy and this will be stored in batteries and they have some few tons 800 tons of batteries in, on on board the ship and they store the electrical energy will be stored there and from that it power the fuel cell uh, the uh, uh, actually it is stored for daytime operation this will be stored from batteries and for nighttime operation the fuel cell um, uh, electrolysis will be done electrolyzed hydrogen will be fed into the fuel cell for operation and they also have a, a city cleaning truck uh, which runs on fuel cell and japan have already started initiatives and they have uh, invested a lot of funding for the uh, olympics but unfortunately it has been postponed but they made completely entire olympic village uh, to work on hydrogen so they they plan to develop hundreds buses city buses which transport the players from one part to the Olympic uh, game centers and so on. Um, and one thing you may know that uh, the 2011 uh, Fukushima nuclear accident, the, this happened after the tsunami uh, hit uh, that Fukushima. So it was, this is the picture which was taken uh, on 11th March 2011 when the accident occurred. But now the same site is completely changed into hydrogen production site. So they have installed like 20 megawatt solar panel and from that solar panel they generate 10 megawatt uh, the electric city is used to uh, produce uh, hydrogen which is operated by a 10 megawatt electrolyzer and per hour they could able to produce 100 kg of hydrogen and this is the world's largest green hydrogen production plant in Japan, in, in the world and britain have also started initiative but it is not in a public transport but they have they are planning to introduce it for public transport by next year so it is called the hydroflux the first hydrogen powered train in uk and china have already started initiatives uh, even before in 2015 itself they have tram they have developed uh, for public transportation which runs on hydrogen and they have also uh, or hydrogen fuel cell trains are in operation and this is the Fortune Fishy Fuel Cell Bus Manufacturing Center, and uh, they have produced nearly 2,300 fuel cell buses in 2019. And coming back to US, uh, the California city, uh, US city is completely made of uh, most of the vehicles you can see if you visit there. Uh, the city transports are zero emission vehicles, uh, uh, picture shown here. Uh, so they have nearly 1,000 fuel cell vehicles on road. Uh, this is a older data, but uh, recent data shows they have near about 3,000 vehicles on road, which is uh, fuel cell vehicles. And this is a powerful army truck, which is a hydrogen fuel cell developed by uh, Tardec. Um, and uh, some of the uh, private sectors, they have also having a fuel cell operated devices in the US. So this is a fuel cell forklift uh, in uh, Walmart. And Apple have installed a, a 10 megawatt solar panel uh, plus fuel cell power station in North Carolina. And this is the most powerful truck which uh, runs on fuel cell, that is Ecola power truck. And Hyundai is also, uh, has also developed a, a powerful truck and it was launched in uh, November 2019. And this uh, Nicola truck is already uh, purchased by Walmart and uh, for uh, transportation of goods, they are doing that. Coming to India, so Banaras Hindu University and IIT Delhi have 
done a lot of work on uh, hydrogen storage devices. And in fact, I worked uh, with uh, Banaras and uh, Hindu University, the Hydrogen Energy Center, where I did my PhD. So we have also developed some of the vehicles which run on hydrogen. So this is a hydrogen fuel, the two wheeler. So in all the cases, we use metal hydrates, intermetallic hydrates, even though it is heavy, but we, were, we are trying to um, uh, demonstrate that vehicle with the use of intermetallic system. And in the later part, we also try to use complex metal hydrates for the storage device. And some of the, this is a three wheeler, which was inaugurated by the hydrogen and uh, International Hydrogen Energy Association president. And uh, this was in uh, collaboration with uh, BHU, International Cars and Motors Limited, and Ministry of New and Renew Renewable Energy. They were planning to, uh, this uh, ministry is supporting to develop a 100 such three-wheeler for, uh, uh, for uh, commercial application, but still somehow the government changed, so it is still in pending. And we have also developed a nano car, which was converted to completely to run on uh, hydrogen fuel. Uh, so you, what you are seeing is that this is a storage system. And from this storage system, it is the engine exhaust heat is fed into it. So it, uh, it is based on IC engine, internal combustion engine, not by fuel cell. And it was, uh, it was inaugurated by the then scientific advisor to government of India. And he was uh, having a ride on that. Um, so it is uh, running on canvas. So it is completely running on hydrogen. Um, uh, it is an internal combustion engine, but uh, run on hydrogen. So that experience also uh, gave me an opportunity to work uh, in one of the uh, next generation zero emission car, which was funded by US Department of Energy and National Institute of Standards and Technology and National Renewable Energy Laboratory. And it was, uh, we have demonstrated that it is a completely a fuel cell based vehicle. And I have especially worked for the storage part that how we can store onboard storage of hydrogen in this vehicle. And a public demonstration was set in Washington DC in 2017. And it is expected to come in the commercial market by uh, 2022, I guess, uh, if I'm right, but I don't know what's the status now. And it was taken by Toyota is have taken this uh, for larger scale production of this uh, zero emission vehicles. And with this, uh, I, I hope I gave you some glimpse of that based on the audience. I couldn't cover much into my research area, but I gave, I think I gave you a feel of what is hydrogen energy, how different countries are focusing towards the implementation of this technology for our future energy application so that uh, our environment will become clean and we may come, we may get back the originality of our nature. So with this, I conclude my talk. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, if anyone have any comments or any questions, you can uh, raise your hands. We will be unmute you. If you have any questions regarding this subjects, you can ask. Yeah, Gauri, ma'am. Yeah, Dr. Uma, you can ask. Yeah, yeah, sir. Sir, I have two questions. Okay. okay. Sir, uh, what is the lifespan for this uh, fuel cell? Sorry? What is the lifespan for the fuel cell? Uh, earlier, it was like 10,000 cycles, but now uh, it has been improved, like 25,000 cycles, uh, because the main part is a membrane. So you can replace the membrane so after the cycle. It's not, you no need to completely replace the fuel cell that membrane can be replaced. So I think it is 25,000 cycles. Okay, sir, and my another question is, okay. uh, why uh, can't we use the bioenergy, biomass energy for okay. uh, converting the chemical energy into an electrical energy by utilizing this uh, hydrogen fuel? Yes, uh, the, the one technique which I have shown, the pyrolysis of methane, so recently they are also using the bio waste like plastics. Uh, you may, um, uh, a few months back, I think two or three months back, I saw a, a research article. There they have, uh, uh, from plastic waste, they are generating hydrogen. They are producing hydrogen. So it is possible. We can produce hydrogen from biomass. But Thank I haven't covered that. Yes, it is possible. Thank you. Yes. 
डॉक्टर किरण यू कैन आस्क नाउ डॉक्टर किरण Hello. Yes, uh, you can ask now. Yes. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Tirumurugan. Mr. Tirumurugan. Hello. Uh, yes. Uh, yes, sir. You can ask now. Can you hear me, sir? Yes, sir. Ah, uh, sir, you told about battery and uh, fuel cells. Yes. Nowadays, no, so many types of battery like lithium-ion battery, so many zinc and everything is there, sir. Yes. You sir. what you will prefer, sir? Then fuel, fuel cells, which you will uh, prefer? So lithium-ion battery is now used. Like Tesla is manufacturing battery vehicles based on lithium-ion. But the issue is uh, recently, like few weeks back, also it was reported that while charging, the Tesla vehicle catches fire at the charging yeah. station. So yeah. yeah, so for light vehicles, battery can also solve. Right? Uh, but for what I told is battery, whatever it is a closed device, whatever the chemical energy which is stored in the battery will be converted into electrical energy. So that is there. So for light It's vehicles, you can use this battery vehicles. But for uh, like trucks or trains, this battery may not solve. That is what my opinion. Yes, Mr. Tirumurugan, sir. Hello. Uh, yeah, sir. you can Leo, hear, sir. Leo, sir, for the metal-heated uh, vehicle system, you oh. need a heating for uh, to release uh, metal, I mean hydrogen from the metal, right? Yes, metal hydride as a storage system, yes, sir. Yeah, you need a heating input, right? Then yes. only it will release the uh, uh, hydrogen. Yes. So how we are giving the uh, heating input? Uh, while running the vehicle that's what i said uh, in my phd i worked on internal combustion engine so whatever the engine exhaust heat it is coming out from the engine okay. it's fed directly into the storage system but initial heating is at the starting initially heat is not needed because usually uh, this materials have some plateau pressure so uh, uh, beyond usually this materials have around 3 atmospheric pressure and when you store the hydrogen Beyond that three atmospheric pressure, uh, it, it will uh, get absorbed in the interstitial, absorbed in the interstitial sites. So, about three atmospheric pressure will be there on the storage pan. Usually, uh, like five atmosphere or six atmosphere is when you. Um, uh, it, it remains on the storage system. Okay. You know, it, it's not completely Basically. locked in the locked inside the lattice, but some hydrogen will be. Uh, uh, Remain in the storage system. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yes, um, Mrs. Anjali, ma'am, you can ask a question. Ah, uh, sir, I have a doubt. Even though the hydrogen cells are um, uh, didn't make any waste product, but the making of these cells in industrial level, yeah. Okay. If the pressure increases inside it, is there any probability it will burst or uh, burn? Uh, uh, sorry, can I, can I can you repeat the question? Mm, there is no wastage in the uh, product level. That means the hydrogen fuel cells. We okay. will the product is hydrogen, okay. and uh, the water is the uh, rest product. Yes. So there is no wastage. Yes. But in, uh, if you use it in the industrial levels, is there any problem if the pressure in inside the uh, fuel cell increases? Is there any probability that it will burst or burn into uh, that kind of problem? So usually, you know, the fuel cell, as I said, you might have seen the animation image. It is a hydrogen will flows. Yes. From from input and it comes on. It's not the pressure is not beyond that. So if from the storage system the pressure is something whatever the pressure you you store, but when you release it, it is not at a, a high pressure. So you may have a different valves. You can control that pressure. Flow meters are there. It's not directly fed into uh, fuel cells or any because through flow meter only it comes. So flow meter 
allows a desired flow range. It won't uh, increase the pressure. So if there is a excess pressure, the the solenoid valve will closes, and there are relief valves which are released bent the pressure. So by that way, you can save the fuel cell. So I think the, uh, there are standard uh, uh, methods by which we can control using flow meters. Okay, sir. Is, is, it, is it what you asked? Yeah. yeah, thank you, ma'am. Uh, next, Mrs. Julian. Mrs. Julian. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, but sorry. this is Mr. Hari. Okay, sorry, sir. Uh, this is Mr. Hari Krishna Prabhu, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. My question is, sir, uh, what about the efficiency of the engine, sir, while you are using the hydrogen as a fuel? Okay. And what about the internal combustion when it comes to an efficiency? What is going to be uh, the output efficiency? It is, uh, in my view, because we haven't tested, but uh, from my knowledge, it is same as that of uh, a petrol engine. So you may not. Uh, too much efficiency, around 35. So efficiency is going to be the same as it is when it yes, compared yes, to the petrol yes, engine? Yes. Okay. Okay, okay, sir. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, sir. If anyone have any questions, you can raise your hands. Yes, Mrs. Birunda. Uh, Mrs. Birunda can ask the question. Hello, sir. Yes, yes, ma'am. Sir, I have a doubt. You said uh, hydrogen is safer than petrol, but the flammability limit of hydrogen is up to 4 to 75 percentage. I, what I've learned is, but in what way hydrogen will be safer than petrol, sir? Uh, so you are talking about le uh, rich and lean mixture, right? Sorry? You are talking about the flammability limit, limit means the rich, rich and lean mixture ratio, the air to fuel ratio. I'm not able to hear you, sir. So are you talking about the air to fuel ratio, the rich and lean mixture? Or uh, uh, the, uh, yes, no, you said the flammability limit. So uh, that yes, is, sir. Okay, that is the air to fuel ratio, right? You are talking yes, about? Sir. Yes, sir. Okay, that, that also helps, you know, uh, that, uh, if you want to compost it, uh, it has a wide, wide range, like with, within that ratio, you can combust the hydrogen within the engine. So that is one advantage, but that does not come in the safety aspect. Safety aspect means one thing is self-ignition, so at what temperature it will automatically ignite. But if you introduce a flame, like even a small spark, it can ignite. That uh, the the flame, uh, even a small in, uh, flame, can ignite the hydrogen fuel. In that way, uh, hydrogen, uh, I could say, uh, safety safety parameter depends on many things, right? How yes. um, you store it. That's that's the reason we are mainly concerned on storage, storage mode of storage. Okay. Um, uh, so the what are the property, the physical property? What I explained is. One is self-ignition temperature and the second is diffusion velocity. Even though the flame uh, occurs, accidental flame occurs, the flame will diffuse upwards. So I have shown you a video. Normally this hydrogen storage system will be placed on the roof of the vehicle in heavy vehicles like trains or trucks. So usually it is uh, preferred to place on the roof. But if accidental fire happens, the flame will go up. It will not spill okay. on ground. So th that way... Fire safety is there, but uh, okay, the other sir. okay. The other safety. What you talk about? What what you are seeing is, I think it is a, it is related with the combustion, rich and fuel mixture ratio. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Yeah, I'm, uh, Mr. Ramasamy. Yes, sir. Do you have any question? Yeah, uh, Mr. Sam Christopher. Hello, sir. Tell me, sir. Sir, is uh, hydrogen uh, certainly cheaper than other cells, sir? Uh, as of now, it is not. 
but a situation may come because it depends on how the way you produce the hydrogen okay sir you, you are talking about hydrogen price or the hydrogen system the fuel cell system price what you are talking hydrogen cell sir Hyd oh, fuel cell fuel cell is expensive it is not okay. affordable to all but it may it is still in the uh, like uh, when uh, when you talk about cheap production that depends on the manufacturing right if you have a bulk manufacturing then ultimately the production cost come down oh okay sir okay so right now uh, not uh, it's not widely commercialized so the production cost and all these factors are high if you uh, think in comparison with that of petrol it is too expensive sir right now which cell is cheaper sir uh, Uh, which fuel cell or what i yes, sir to yes, sir fuel cell sir which cell is sir lithium or zinc fuel cell is polymer exchange membrane fuel cell is cheaper compared to other molten uh, i i didn't get your question so which uh, cell zinc fuel cell or what you are asking are you talking comparing with batteries ah uh, yes sir Uh, battery, I think lithium ion battery is cheaper, but they are doing uh, R and Ds on uh, lithium air batteries and so on. But uh, to my knowledge, I think lithium ion battery is cheaper compared to other battery technologies. Thank you, sir. Mr. Pon Lakshmanan, Mr. Pon Lakshmanan. Hello. Sir, you can ask the question, Mr. Pon Lakshmanan. Yes, Mr. Jan Lal, Mr. Jan Lal, Mr. Jan Lal. Uh, yes sir hello oh, yeah, yes. tell me sir tell us oh, sorry i forgot to ask one more question uh, hmm. why we are using this hydrogen as a fuel and okay. what is the compression ratio inside the piston sir uh, is it a different or is going to be the same as the petrol engine uh, it, it will be different but not too much in comparison with that of petrol um, okay Uh, but but you can have a lean and rich. The ratio air fuel mixture ratio is uh, hydrogen has a wide uh, range. So in that way, okay, you, you are talking about that, right? The inside. Yes, the, yes, the compression. Yes. Okay, it is. I think uh, it has a wide range of compression compressibility. So that is advantage okay. over petrol. Hmm. Yes, sir. Okay. 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 Thank you, sir. Okay. Sir. Presentation was the. Uh, good and we are uh, really motivated to do some research over these areas really okay. thank you so much okay sir. thank you thank you sir i really appreciate it thank you mr yeah. pon lakshmanan mr pon lakshmanan mr pon lakshmanan or mr ramaswami or ramaswami from nist Yes, sir. Pon Lakshmanan, sir, you can talk. Yes. Mrs. Rama Lakshmi. Mrs. Rama Lakshmi. Yes, sir. Ah, uh, yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Hello. Ah, yes, ma'am. I can hear you. Yeah, ma'am. You can ask the question. Yes, Mr. Mrs. Rama Lakshmi, you can ask the questions. I can hear you, ma'am. Mr. N. P. Ramesh. Hello, sir. Ah, yes, sir. Ah, good evening, sir. Ah, good evening, sir. Sir, hydrogen fuel is safety for our vehicle. Uh, definitely. 
that that is so, uh, I don't, you know that depends, very high temperature that, that depends on the storage uh, method because we are okay. trying to develop a safe uh, mode of storage uh, storing hydrogen that is what metal hydrates are preferred okay okay, okay sir a any other question sir no no sir hydrogen is yes sir Uh, sorry, uh, your voice is not yeah, clear, sir. I see. Okay. Do you have to say pure water or sea water? Uh, production. You are talking about produ production, right? Ah, uh, hey, hydro hydrogen production. Ah, uh, sir. Uh, sea water is uh, preferred because it, it has salt. You know, the pure water electrolysis yeah. is dif difficult. Okay. Okay. It, it's, okay. Okay. Oh, okay. Thank you, sir. Okay, sir. Yes. Thank you all. The session is going to over. Uh, you can fill the feedback form which you have. Uh, we have sent that feedback form to your mail, and after filling the feedback form, you will receive the certificate through that mail ID. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you sir.